Amen. Thanks, Miguel. Great job. This is my song. Acts 27. I invite you to go there. We're making our way through. We're almost to the end of the book of Acts. We'll come to one of my favorite sermons I preach in the last two verses of the book of Acts. I've preached it over and over and over, and I'm going to finally preach it here when we get to the end uh, and talk about advancing the gospel. But we're not there yet. We're still in the 27th chapter. We're still in the storm. We got Paul uh, going through the storm. We're going to throw a map up on the screen and show you that. You saw it last week of where uh, Paul was and where he went. And uh, you saw him leaving over here in Caesarea up to Sidon. We took him last week to top of Cyprus up to Myra. And finally, they got down to Fair Havens. We left him in Fair Havens last week uh, there on the island of Crete. And they're trying to make their way to Rome up in the left-hand corner because Paul has appealed to Caesar and the, he's on this prison boat and they're taking he and Luke and Aristarchus that we met last week and they're taking them there and winter has come. It's into October and he's getting ready to go out and Paul said, mm, if I was in charge of this deal, we'd stay right here. But the captain took a poll, and the majority one said, nope, let's try to make it to Phoenicia. Well, they, I mean, to Phoenix. And so they were trying to get to Phoenix, and from Fair Havens, where we'll find them today going to Malta, that red line across there is 14 days of hurricane. They did not see the sun or the stars for 14 days. They're in a storm. They're in a mess. When this storm, the Uroquilo is the word. Two words put together, half of it Greek and half Latin. The Uroquilo came and started to blow and they couldn't handle it. And so they just up and around and down and crashing and going for 14 days across there. We'll find them and we're going to pick up a piece of that in Acts 27 and I'll begin reading in verse 14 and just read down through verse 26 though we could read all the way to 44 and we'll talk about some of that but that's when they wind up shipwrecked the ship gone broken apart and they're at Malta and that's where we'll pick them up next week in chapter 28 making their way to Rome but let's get them through the storm a message that I've entitled in the eye of the storm Acts 27, 14, you follow along because this is the word of our great God. But before very long there rushed down from the land a violent wind called Uroquilo. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, and we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables and undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis. They let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day as we were being violently storm tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. They lost all hope. And when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. And yet now I urge you, Keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men. For I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. You'll notice in the next verse that the 14th day came. If you read on down, you'll find that they were on a ship that was filled with wheat. 
It had come from Alexandria in Egypt, which was the breadbasket for Rome. They jettisoned all the wheat. They got rid of everything. They were making the ship as light as they could make it. They threw out four anchors. Couldn't hold them. Finally, they took up the anchors, and they started and took them all the way through. And verse 44 says that the rest should follow. Some were swimming, and some were on planks. The King James says, of course, boards and other various things from the ship. I was a kid preacher, and I heard somebody preach on this text, and they said it was the, <laughs> the first board meeting in the Bible right here. They're floating on these boards going toward the shore. They were headed to the beach, coming to Malta where they would finally find safety, though they lost it all. Friend, you ever been in a storm? Some storms you make yourself. Some storms other people make for you. And some storms, you don't have a clue where they came from. They just show up like these two ladies talked about breast cancer. It just is a storm. But Paul is in the storm, but he's in the eye of the storm. I moved here 33 years ago, and my wife asked the search committee, do you ever have hurricanes in Pensacola? <laughs> they said, we've not had one in 67 years. I think we've had 67 since I moved here. <laughs> when we lived over on McGregor, there was a small hurricane, Category 1 came through, and they told us, that the eye was going to come right over Pensacola. I'd never in my life experienced this. Boy, the front end of that thing came through and the trees bent over and it got nasty. It was in the middle of the day. And then it got as calm as it is in this room right here. We went outside and visited with our neighbors. And they said, you know, we've just got a few minutes here. We're in the eye of the storm. They said, but the backside's coming, so when you begin to feel the breeze, you better go back in your house. But for a little while, not even a whisper, just the eye of the storm. Eventually, that back wall came across, and it got rough again. The storm passed us by. We stood in the eye. That's where Paul lived. Hosey Lister in 1957 wrote a song when the till the storm passes by. I've asked my good friend John Tyner to sing the first stanza. Listen to this and listen to the chorus. Then I want you to sing the chorus. Some of you are old enough in here you remember singing this song. John didn't have a clue. He had to go look this up, right, John? Yes, he did. I've been singing this all week long. I've been singing it with the Gaither Quartet. This song is best done with a quartet, but John's going to do all four parts right now. Go, John, sing. Amen. Listen. In the dark of the midnight Have I altered my face While the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place In the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry Keep me safe Till the storm passes by Till the storm passes over the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm 
sing his chorus with John right now. Sing it with me. in the middle of this storm. Amen. Give John a hand. That's good. I want to be a singer. I'm just not cut up for it. So, uh, but I love to sing and just make a noise. Paul is in the middle of the storm and two times in verse 22 and verse 25. Now the first thing is in verse 21. We know he was a Baptist because he said, I told you so. Amen. Paul said, if you'd listen to me, boys, we'd still be back at Fair Havens having shrimp on the barbie. But oh, no. Y'all had to get out in this mess. But he said, verse 22, yet now I urge you, keep up your courage. King James says, be of good cheer. This, there's joy in this. Paul is telling me, keep, keep, keep your courage up. Keep joy. In, your, in the middle of the storm, keep joy. And he got down to verse 25. He said, therefore, second time, keep up your courage. Be of good cheer. Keep up your joy. What are the keys to keeping courage in the storm? Paul gives them to us right here in this text. There are three keys to keeping courage in the storm, and how do you live in the eye of the storm when all the mess is blowing by? Paul said three things. Number one, in verse 23, for this very night an angel of God to whom I belong. First key to keeping courage is to know this. You belong to God. I belong to God. I am his. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 said, you have been purchased with a price. And you ought to glorify God in your body. Acts 20 and 28 tells us the price that was paid. It was the blood of his own son. In 1 Corinthians 3, 23, the Bible says you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. If you are in Christ, Christ belongs to the Father. You belong to Christ. Galatians 3.29, you belong to Christ and you are his heirs. Because you belong to him, you inherit all that he has. In Galatians 5.24, you belong to Christ. Therefore, you should crucify the flesh with its passions and its desires because you are not your own. You've been purchased with the price. Listen to me, dear friend. Listen to this, preacher. If you're saved, you do not belong to yourself. You belong to one that's not of this world. You belong to one who's got the whole world in his hand. You are safe and you can't die till God. God says so. They can't touch you till God says so. You'll not go to heaven till God says so. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to the Father, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Sanctifier. He is Lord. He is King. How do you become Him? Well, when you come into this world, you belong to yourself. But when you get saved, there's a transfer that comes. Hallelujah. You you enter the transfer portal. You move from your team to his team. Hallelujah. God takes you out of sin and puts you into salvation. He takes you out of the flesh and puts you into Christ. And when that happens, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You're his. I have two children. They're mine. I 
I had just a little bit to do with making them. My wife carried the load, but they're ours. They have our name. I'll fight you for them. They're mine. I keep trying to give them away. <laughs> Amen. And Rachel got married, and she and Brad stood right there. I said, do you take your hand out of my pocket and put it in his pocket? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. What are you doing in it, Skip? Amen. Yes, sir. But she's still mine. She's still mine. My daughter looked at me a few years ago and she said, when y'all get old. I said, when? <laughs> she said, I'm talking about when y'all get real old. Mama can come live with us. <laughs> she said, but you are going to a home. That's where you <laughs> I said, don't you forget who's got the inheritance deal around here. I'm still in charge. My mother's 92. I still belong to her. And dear friend, when I was little like this little boy that got saved today, and baptized today, I mean saved, I entered the transfer portal. And I became... A child of God. I belong to Him. Amen. How do you make it through the storm? You know who controls the storm. You belong to Him. You say, Preacher, I'd like to get in on that. Well, there's a picture out here in the foyer I put up. I had a friend gave me this picture this week, and I said, Well, I might use that. And so I propped it up out here. And put it it's a bridge going across a canyon and and you can see it it's a, a rope bridge going across and dear friend if today you're on the lost side of the canyon of life and you want to go to the other side of the canyon of life and you hear God calling you and leading you he'll come get you and he'll walk you across the bridge to the other side and when that happens you transfer from this side to that side you have been the Bible says born again born of the Spirit of God. How do you make it through the storm? You are His if you are saved. He controls the outcomes. I Look at what Paul said. To God, whom to whom I belong. I belong to Him. He purchased me with a price. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The first key to making it through the storm and living in the eye of the storm is to say, I belong to God. Number two, he said in the latter part of verse 23, not only did he say that I heard from this angel of God, this God to whom I belong, but whom I serve. You'll make it through the storm when you know that you belong to God. Secondly, when you know that you serve God. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace. They said, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us. We serve him, and he's able. Psalm 100 and verse 2, the 100th Psalm in the second verse says that we are to serve the Lord with what? Gladness and calm before him with joyful that's our word here joyful singing keep up the courage be of good cheer Galatians 5 and verse 13 tells us that you were called to freedom brethren turn your freedom into an opportunity through this love you are to serve one another amen get your hands dirty Romans 7 and verse number 6 says that we serve in newness of spirit Amen. Yes. You find that in Romans 7, verse 5 and 6. We are to serve in the newness, not the oldness of the flesh, but the newness. We, we serve. Some of y'all need to get up off your pew and begin to do something. 
I said, some of you need to get off your pew and get up and do something. Serving with gladness. We ordain deacons around here. You, you know, the Bible says that deacons are to serve. And the word deacon, diakoneo, literally means serve. You become a deacon, you become a foot washer. The pastors, the elders are, are foot washers. I want to say something. I'm, I, I've had this in my heart all week long. We live by faith. We walk by faith. But bless God, we're supposed to do something because if you say I've got faith and you do nothing, your faith is dead. We, we, we got, you need to do. Whatever it is God's called you, you don't do what you're not called to do. Just do what God assigns you to do. In this text, you, you, I was amazed at what they did going through this storm. They put ropes around the ship. They got hold of the rudder. They put out five different anchors. They had food. They took measurements. Oh, we're getting close and so many fathoms and we're about to run aground. They did everything they knew to do. When the thing, thing finally crashed, they didn't just say, okay, God, I'm here. No, they started to swim or got on a plank and, and made that. There's work to do. Faith without works is dead. Listen to me. If you're going to work in the storm as if you were in the eye of the storm, not only you've got to know you belong to God, you must serve God. Paul said this, God, I serve him. I've, I've laid my life down. And church, let me tell you, when you begin to go through the tough times, you know that you're his, you belong to him. But you're serving in the middle of the storm. You do what needs to be done. They couldn't save this ship. But that didn't mean they weren't supposed to try. They did everything they knew to do. God brought them through. But I want to encourage you to find somebody to serve. You say, well, I wouldn't, you know, I don't have a job in the church. If you're saved, find a job to do. I don't mean here. I mean, go love your neighbor. I was talking to a sweet lady this week. She'd been off somewhere and been gone and then somebody got sick and she couldn't get home she sent me a note she said pastor I got home my grass was cut the flower beds had been all the weeds had gone out of it she said there were some other things that needed she said these, these neighbors they didn't ask they just came and did it and I'm so grateful Serve one another. It'll get you through the storm. I belong to God. I serve God. But now number three, bedrock truth. Paul said in verse 25, after he said this angel had spoken to him, he said, therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God. Not only do I say I belong to God and I serve God, but then we must come to the place of saying, I believe God. The angel spoke. Paul said, I've staked my life on what this angel said, and I'm going forth. He didn't have the New Testament. Do you know that on this ship, there were a bunch of prisoners, soldiers, a preacher and six books of the New Testament. Paul hadn't put them on parchment yet, but there were four prison epistles. There was the Gospel of Luke because he was there, and the book of Acts was on his ship. God was putting the Bible together in the middle of a storm. And Luke and Paul were saying, we believe God. I want to ask you this morning. You're in this room. You're in the room at Warrington. You're in the room at home. Maybe you're on the, in the car listening on the radio. Wherever you, do you believe God today? Does anybody in here believe God? Do you believe him enough to ask him to save you? Oh, dear friend at home, would you, would you bow your head and say, God, save me? 
I visited a sweet lady in the hospital. She lives over in Alabama, watches us every Saturday afternoon. I went to see her this week in the hospital. She asked if I'd come. She'd been very sick. She took me by the hand. She pointed at her husband and she said, he knows at five o'clock on Saturday afternoon, he's to be quiet, get out of the house and turn on the television to the right channel because I'm about to have church. Well, if you're watching on television today, live or a replay, I encourage you, would you believe God today? Would you ask Jesus to save you? The Bible says in John 6 and verse number 47, don't miss this, John 6, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Friend, if he's drawing you today, if you would believe and step out and say, yes, he'd save you. Last Sunday, I preached, and there's a gentleman sitting right over here. He's not here today because he's gone. He'll be here next Sunday. Trust me, I'm hopefully going to baptize him. I've been working on this guy for months and months and months. I preached to him hard last Sunday. Shooting right over Joe Crash's head right there. Bam, bam. I gave the invitation out in the foyer. When I got there, he was standing in the next steps room crying. He's a grown man, runs a phenomenal business here in our city. He was standing there weeping. I walked in, I looked at him, he looked at me, and he said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm ready to do it. He decided he's going to believe God. And God gloriously saved him right out there in the next steps room last Sunday. And what God did for him, he'd do for you today. But you must believe God. You must believe that you'll go to hell by yourself. You must believe that Jesus is the only way. You must understand that you have not gotten so far from God that you can't be redeemed. And that he is reaching and saving to the uttermost. And he's calling you. And when he touches your soul, you turn and believe. You must believe God. Believe him for salvation. But secondly, you must believe him for security. For security. You sitting here today and you're saved. I just want to ask you, do you believe God today? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Listen to this verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things, say that, not seen. (laughs) Not seen. You get assurance with faith. You get hope. It's the assurance of what you hope for. It's the conviction of what you can't see. Friend, you don't walk by what you can see in this Christian life. You walk by what you can't see. And when God speaks, you got to decide, am I going to believe God or am I going to doubt God? The elders received a good report in verse number 2 of Hebrews 11 because they believed God. Paul had a word from heaven and he believed God. For 14 days he hadn't seen the sun or the stars. You got to decide today you're going to believe God or not believe God. See, friend, when you're saved, you live in two worlds. When you get saved, you live in two worlds. You live in the sense world, the five senses, and you also live in the spiritual world. Before you get saved, you just live in the sensual world. Most of you make something sexual out of that, but I don't mean it. I'm talking about what you smell, touch, see, your five senses. But when you get saved, the senses don't die. But now you live in two worlds. You live in the sense world, you live in the spiritual world. And when God speaks, you've got to decide, am I going to believe God and what he says that I can't see, or am I going to just believe what I feel and what I think? Most of us get in a mess because we decide, well, you know, it makes sense to me. (laughs) Not everything God says is going to make sense to you. But when you get a word from God, you've got to line up three things if you're going to know the will of God and do it. 
You get an eternal promise out of the Word of God. It's got to be biblically true. Secondly, you get wise counsel from godly people. And thirdly, you get the inner compulsion of the Holy Ghost within you and the peace of God rules your heart. And then you know exactly what you're supposed to do. The Word of God speaks, the wise counsel speaks, and then the Spirit of God speaks. And when those things get lined up, you need to stand right there and don't let all hell nor heaven move you. If there's a storm in your life today, and you say, Pastor, I'm not in a storm. Well, you're either headed for one or coming out of one because they're coming. I can tell you right now, this life is filled with them. You've got to decide that you belong to God, that you're going to serve God, that you're going to believe God. John didn't sing stanza number two because I didn't ask him to. But Mosey Lister wrote this song, 1957. He wrote a second stanza. Many times Satan whispered, there's no need to try. For there's no end of sorrow And there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me. And tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the skies. Till the storm passes over. Till the thunder sounds no more. Till the clouds roll forever. From the sky, hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Live in the hollow of his hand. Live in the eye of the storm. I'm living in a storm right now. You're living in a storm. Oh, mine's not so bad. But it's a storm. See, mother's 92. She knew me yesterday, but I think Thursday for the first time she didn't know me. That's the first time in my life I ever think that happened. I'm not sure, but. So I'm walking through. (laughs) Now, she was smart enough to take care of herself financially, so she can do that. I don't have nothing left, but she'd be all right. And that's okay. Not mine. It's hers. Amen. But man, it hurts. Just hurts. So I I was out there with her yesterday and I was practicing. I sat there and held her hand. And I said, Lord, both of us belong to you. And Lord, we both serve you. And Lord, I don't know if she knows how, but I'm on her behalf. I'm going to believe you. When you're ready, I'm ready. She's ready. But until then, we're just going to live in the hollow of your hand. I gave up that burden yesterday. I've been trying to fix that. I can't fix it. I'm not smart enough to fix it. Thank you for not saying amen. (laughs) I can't fix that. 
But you see, I live in two worlds. I, 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 with Mama, I, I live too much over here in this sensory world. And, and I, I got to live over here and know she belongs and we serve. And we're going to believe God. Amen. He's got it. They're going to trust him. May have a bigger storm this week, but that's what I'm walking through right now. Until that storm passes by.